to understand the foramen, neural foramen, as well as I already have shown you that again, just for the recapitulation. So the disc, uh, the neural foramen, neural foramen anatomy should be, should be very nicely learned. Neural foramen, uh, upper boundary, you can unmute and you can talk with me. So roof is by how? Roof is formed by? Inferior border of pedicle. One pedicle, one pedicle above. Hmm? So roof is by one pedicle above. Then floor by another pedicle below. Then anterior border of the foramen is upper part by body. 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 The lower part is by the disc. <coughs> the posterior part, upper part by superior articular foramen. So inferior articular sorry. The, the inferior articular process. This is the inferior articular process and this is the superior articular process. So this is the neural foramen. And now I am adding the, let me first, you know, the stop the annotation. Okay. So what is happening? Okay, let me add the nerves now. So look at, see how the nerves are there. So you see, the this though this 3D anatomy is not ex, ex, the completely correct. So basically, the nerve root comes out from the upper part, this upper part, and uh, it is accompanied by blood vessels there. The lower part is comparatively free. And you look at the facet joint also. So this is your medial branch. Let me draw the annotation again. So we'll be discussing this part when I will be showing you the on the on the on the mannequin on the mannequin on the, the procedure. So one facet joint is supplied by two medial branch. One medial branch. You can see the dorsal rami is having the one the branch is here. This is medial branch. This is going to supply one facet joint above and one facet joint below. Also, the interspinous ligaments and multifidus muscle, which is their multifidus muscle. So these are the branches of the medial branch. So the medial one facet joint is supplied by the one medial branch from below and one medial branch from above. That means if this facet joint I need to innervate, I need to place one needle here, another needle here, one at the same level, another at the above level. So this is for the facet joint. So facet joint, it can be medial branch or it it can be within the joint. We can come needle and go for this. Transformal injections, as I told you, transformal injection is your, there are two types of transformal injections. Let me clear the drawing. So one is your needle might be coming. Your needle might be coming here. Then it is called shape triangle approach or your needle might be coming here. This is called the Cambin's triangle approach. One is, this is also called the supraneural approach. This is also called the intraneural approach below the nerve. So these are the few procedures which I'll be showing. Any more questions before I am going for the practice uh, on the showing the, on the mannequin? No more questions? So disc pathology, remember it very nicely and don't think that all prolapse are all disc bulges are going to produce pain. Another thing you always remember that more than 50% of the prolapse, this bulging, this remains asymptomatic. So they need not be treated. Sir, which is better, sir? Transforminal block or epidural steroid? Epidural is also, transforminal is also an epidural. When you are giving the transforminal, when you are going through the transforamin, yes, what sir. is your target? Yes, we are also going yes. into the epidural space. So basically, epidural space have the your okay. Let me show you the three D anatomy again. Okay, 
So epidural space is space around the, let me start the annotation again. So this is posterior epidural space. When you are giving the interlaminar epidural coming like this or like this, we are in injecting drugs here. This epidural space is your posterior epidural space. Whereas yes. when you are going through the foramen, we are going into the anterior epidural space. This epidural space is anterior epidural space. This epidural space is lateral epidural space. So when you are going into the foramen, we are basically injecting the anterior and the lateral foramen. This is more effective than the interlaminar. This is known as the interlaminar epidural. So interlaminar okay. epidural is injecting drug here and you are expecting the drug will be going anteriorly here. But if there is an inflammation, if there is a fibrosis, the drug may not be going nicely here. That is the reason why transforminal epidural is always effective if your knob root is the source of the pain. If the knob root is the pain generator because of the prolapse disc is coming and impinging the knob root, then the transforminal epidural is more effective. But remember, the transforminal epidural is also a kind of epidural. Interlaminal epidural yes, is also a kind of epidural. And caudal yes, epidural is also a kind of epidural. So you can reach the epidural yes, space through the different windows. You can come from okay, any of these windows to reach there in your epidural space. Okay, sir. Clear? Thank you, sir. Clear, sir. Any other questions by anybody? Otherwise, I'll be going for the demonstrations part. Sir, while lying in the bed, uh, what is the position recommended for an acute PIVD patient? Can you repeat the question again? While lying on the bed, uh, what is the position recommended for an acute PIVD patient? What is the position recommended means? Position for what? So lying down answer, position, sir? in what position should the patient lie? <laughs> for the in intervention? No, no. In acute pain, no, no, sir. Sir, she is asking in case of acute PIVD, what will be the position of the patient, uh, recommended position of the patient in, while sleeping or lying down, sir? In bed. Anything, in anything, whatever is comfortable for the patient. There is no such recommended procedures. Normally, this feels, this patient feels comfortable on bending the leg, both hip and knee. I already told earlier that yeah. to relax the nerve root, we should flex the hip and knee. Then the uh, now, brute are most relaxed. So the patient uh, becomes most comfortable when he is lying down on the lateral decubitus with the both hip and knee flexed. Then the nerve brute will be relaxed and the patient might be having less pain. But whatever I tell my patients, there is no such position than this is good, this is bad, nothing. Earlier, absolute bed rest, you know, all those things was recommended for the acute PIVD. Nowadays, all those recommendations are there in the history book. So nothing is important there. Always try to make the patient mobile. Ask the patient to walk. And movement will be keeping your disc healthier. So ask the patient, whatever position is comfortable for you, it will be good for you. But as I told you, most patient feels comfortable with the lateral decubitus with hip and knee flexed because that causes the relaxation of the nerve. But anything comfortable for the patient is okay. Thank you, sir. Normally, they recommend uh, supine with flexion of the knee and elbow by put a uh, hip knee and uh, hip by putting a pillow just uh, below the. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Whatever is comfortable for them is okay. Nothing. Earlier, all those recommendations were earlier recommendations. Now it is nothing is there. Ask the patient which position gives you the best comfort. So, but as I told you, as you were telling also, that normally flexion of the hip and the knee causes relaxation of the nerve roots and gives the comfort to the patient. But there is Thank nothing you, which is, this is good, this is bad. Any other question from anybody? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir, how can, how can we differentiate pain? Is it from piriformis muscles or is it from neurogenic pain? Both pain are radiating to the leg. Piriformis or? A neurogenic pain due to uh, nerve compression. There is neurogenic pain is too vague term. Tell the disc prolapse, which is causing the nerve root pain. That is the it's commonest difference. The 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 okay. Neurogenic pain is a vague term. There are lots of neurogenic pain out there. All pain are neurogenic pain, basically. So anyway, what is coming back to your question? That the piriformis, as I told you, that how to, piriformis is a myofacial pain. So how to diagnose the myofacial pain? By stretching that muscle. I already mentioned just now. 
that the piriformis syndrome, the patient, the internal rotation and the adduction will be stressing the piriformis muscle and that will be aggravating the pain. Okay. Okay, let me prepare. You can ask me the go on asking the question. I'll be asking Sanjeev to come here and uh, let us prepare the uh, the mannequin. And meanwhile, you can go on asking me questions. Uh, sir, I want to ask one question. Some patients are complaining pain whenever they stand up. Uh, but they are totally pain-free when they are in sitting position. What could be the pain generator and solution for this, sir? So where is the pain? Back or leg? Back, sir. Back. Just now I and told you, you just try to answer based on whatever I have talked, that what are the causes of the back pain, where the pain will be comfortable. Patient is not having pain. And answer the opposite things also. What are the conditions where the pain will be aggravated on sitting? And what are the conditions where the pain will be relieved on sitting? Sir, uh, PIVD may be the cause of the pain while the sitting, uh, some facet joint pain. Yeah. Right. yeah. Hello. Interspinous. Liga ligamentum phlegm hypertrophy. Ligamentum phlegm hypertrophy. Yes, yes, yes. And even spinal, spinal canal stenosis also causes pain uh, in a uh, uh, sitting position. Yes, the question answer sessions. So, uh, what I was asking you that if the patient <clears throat> pain is relieved on sitting, what are the conditions? Sitting means, sir, in flexion or in extended position, or in, I mean, in uh... sitting means always some amount of the flexion will be always there. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, what are the conditions? One is facet. Facet pain is the commonest reason why. The patient will be having the back pain on sitting or sitting to standing, but sitting itself will not produce any pain. That is the commonest reason. And other is your canal stenosis. But few other conditions are also there. Say, for example, the patients might be having the, you know, the 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 psoas myofascial pain, or the patient might be having the comfortable on sitting. Any other questions? I, and I, I asked you the other things also. So other thing means uh, I asked that if the patient is having the, uh, the, the conditions, back pain, which is aggravated on sitting. What are the causes? SI joint, sir. Very good. One is SI joint. What are the other conditions? Discogenic... Uh... Very good. Discogenic back pain, internal disc disruption. Anything, oh. anything else? Vertebral compression fracture, sir. Very good. Vertebral compression fracture. Interspinous ligament Interspinous pain. Interspinous ligament. Sir. Yes, very good. What else? Coxidynia, sir. English, please. Coxidynia, sir. Coxidynia, very good. What else? I did, this sir. Syndrome. I did you already told discogenic back pain because of the internal disc disruption. Piriformis syndrome. Piriformis, very good. But piriformis. Quadratus lamborum, sir. Yes, quadratus lamborum also. So these are the things where the back pain will be aggravated on sitting. And back pain will be relieved on sitting. These are the three. One is psoas muscle, inter uh, myofascial spell pain. Then your if it is your the facet joint, and if it is a Okay, so all of you can see my screens, no? One side yes. we are having the uh, Cian picture, another side is your mannequin. So this side of the of the mannequin is your head, this side, and this side is your leg. It is only the trunk part, the spine part. Those who have not seen this mannequin, so this part is your buttock part, this part is your neck part, shoulder part. Okay. Everybody can see it? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, just a minute. Give me a few minutes time to adjust it.
Any question you can write in chat box. I'll try to answer. Meanwhile. Any questions, please ask. I'll try to answer on those series. Okay, so we're ready. And uh, we'll be demonstrating you. We can see the CM there. So CRM has a little bit of, before we start, little bit of about the CRM. So normally CRM has two part. One part is below what you can see here. This is your X-ray tube. From where the X-ray are emitting and remember that X-ray are diverging. It's like that. It's not parallel. Why it is important? Because if your object like here, the patient, if it is coming closer to it, then the image will be magnified or the vice versa. This part is your image intensifier. It is catching it. So if this is coming closer to the patient, then your image will be less uh, you know, magnified. And if it is away, and if this x tube is coming closer, then the image will be magnified. So this x tube should always be kept down. Why? Because the important reason is your scattered radiation. If it is kept below, the X-ray beam will be coming like that and it'll be reflecting back scattered so that the persons around is not getting the radiation. Whereas if you are putting the X-ray tube above, what will happen? It will be coming like this and it will be showered all persons around it. So that is the reason why you should be always keeping the X-ray tube below and never, never, ever above. Remember this very simple rule that you should never put the X-ray tube above. So what is this view called? AP view or PA view? So if the patient is lying prone, your spine is posterior, this is anterior. So CRM is coming from here. So anterior to posterior, this is A and this is P. So this is an AP view. If we are putting it X-ray tube above, then we call it as a PA view, P to A. So PA view should not be done. Always do the AP view, not PA view. Patient will be lying prone and PA view. Next important part of the radiation hazard is your, is your the lateral view. If you're doing it lateral, then also there will be a lot of radiation. But still, unless you are having the lateral view, you cannot understand what is there. So lateral view is mandatory, but lateral view should be done very minimal. Mostly, you have to do it AP and oblique. Oblique also gives little bit of radiation, not as much as the PA view or lateral view. So always remember these very basic things. And if you are appearing for any of the fellowship exams, the radiation hazards is one of the very important things. And you should be having the you know badge, which will be telling you how much radiation is there. So there is a principle which is called ALARA. A-L-A-R-A. 
A R A Alara and uh, multiple choice question comes. Hot is Alara. Alara full forms is as low as reasonably achievable. Alara. What is the full term? As low as reasonably achievable. Reasonably achievable. What is the meaning of that? That means why you are having this X-ray image or CRM image? Because you want to do some procedures nicely, comfortably. So reasonably achievable means your exposure should be minimum, your radiation exposure should be minimum, but that should not compromise your procedure. That is why it is reasonably achievable. That means try to have the exposure as minimal as possible. Never ever do an AP view, always PA view, always AP view. Do as minimal as lateral view as possible. And the maximum exposure we, could, we give when you are giving continuous. So never do continuous, except when you are injecting dye. When you're injecting dye, you need to see the dye, whether it is spreading around the blood vessels, which is very dangerous. So in that situation, a very short period, you can give a continuous, or also this is called cine image. So cine image should be done as minimal as possible, but still sometimes cine image is needed. And remember this Alara principle, as low as reasonably achievable, as low as reasonably achievable, Alara principle. So now let us come with this Your So here the patient is lying prone. This is your back side. This is your caudal side, buttock side. This is your shoulder side. I hope you all can see the serum as well as the mannequin nicely. So patient is lying prone. Serum here is your the x-ray part, tube part. This is your. So now if we are getting the image, we are getting this kind of image. And we have to identify each and everything because serum image is a 2D image. It's not a 3D image. But you have to do the procedure on a 3D patient. This patient is not a 2D patient. It's a 3D patient. So you have to, in your brain computer, by looking, taking the X-ray from different angle, you have to create a 3D image in your brain. Then only you can do the procedure. So I'll be asking you what are the different structures, how it looks on AP, on oblique, on lateral. So let me do that exercise first, and then I'll be talking other things. So now tell me. So what is this? Unmute yourself, talk, and then again mute. Spinous process. Spinous process. Very good. What is this? Transverse process. Very good. What is this? Pedicle. 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 It looks oval. You know why it looks oval? How exactly is the pedicle? So pedicle is nothing but a filler. The pedicle is nothing but a Please remain muted. Only when you are talking, then only you talk. As of time, you please remain muted. So, pedicle is like a pillar. Suppose I'm just drawing here and give an example. So, suppose this is a pillar. And if your X-ray beam is falling like this, how it will look? It will be looking like a round set. And if the X-ray beam is like, looking like that, then it will be sitting as a rod. So, same way, the pedicle, when you are looking by the, that means serum is falling in that pillar. This is the one end of the pillar. Also the end on view, it's also called the end on view. So the end on view, we are looking like a pillar, but actually the pedicle is not like a round separate anything. It is like a pillar only. Okay, so what is this part? Tell, tell, tell. What is this? Lamina. Lamina. Why, what is the? Maybe this is inferior facet. 
inferior <clears throat> articular process. This one I was talking, inferior articular process. What is this? this superior, superior articular, articular, articular process. Articular yeah. process. What is this? This part of the bone? Parse interarticular. Inter 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 Very good. So these are the important things what we can see in the AP image. And this space is obviously is the disc space. This space. So now let us have the lateral view. And let us identify, try to identify the structures on the lateral view. So now again, tell me the structures, what you can see here. What is this? Vertebral body. Vertebral body. Vertebral body. Disc space. Now you can see the pedicle. This is a pedicle as a pillar. I was telling this is a pedicle as a pillar, but when the CRMO beam was coming like this, it was looking like a oval like this. But what you are seeing from the lateral view, the pedicle will be looking like a pillar only. So this was your pedicle. And where is your transverse process? You are seeing a very big, large bone. Here, the transverse process is seen like a round separate things. Okay, one here, one here, not overlap. So like pedicle was seen as a round separate oval structures on the AP view, same way, the transverse process looks like a rounded oval separate body in the lateral view. And this is your spinous process. This is your? Inferior articular process. Very good. This is your? Superior. superior articular process. Very good. And yeah. this is your foramen. So knob root, foramen, one boundary by one pedicle, another boundary by another pedicle. The inferior part of the foramen, post inferior posterior part is your superior articular process. This is your inferior articular process. This is your upper part of the vertebral body. This is the disc. And the knob root is here. Knob root is here. And it is accompanied Thank by you, okay. One here, one here, artery and vein anterior to the nerve root. So the mm -hmm. nerve root remains in the upper one third of the foramen. Always remember that. And if your needle is coming like that here, then we call it as a subpedicular approach of the transforaminal epidural. If your needle is coming here, then we call it as a cambium triangle approach. Cambium triangle approach. Okay. Now, is in our mind, again, let us go into the APB. And we'll be starting with the basic lumbosacral procedure, what are the different steps. Okay, so first step is to have a true APB. True APB means what? That here you see, this is the spinous process. This is the one pedicle, this is one pedicle. Is this distance is equal? No. no. So that means this no. is true AP image. So you may not have a true AP image. And even if your CRM is at in zero degree, even then you might not be having a true AP image. So to have a true AP image, what do you have to do? You have to, so first step is to have a true AP image. And for the true AP image, you have to make this distance equal. So now you see, we are trying to correct it. Okay, another thing I forgot to mention, you know, I'm putting a radio opaque marker here and you always have to see which is right and which is left. Picture. So this is left side. I'm holding the probe here. This is left. This is right. Picture. This is right. So remember, when you are doing the CM guided procedures, the right should be right. Left should be left. It's not like an X plate. X plate it is opposite. But in the CRM guided procedures, your monitor, the right should be right, left should be left. And you have to always, before doing the procedure, you always should be looking for the, which is right side, which is left side. So now, here you see that this is L5, this is L4, this is L3. So, what is important here, you see, after I am having the true AP image. So first step is true AP image. Now we are having the true AP image. And okay, now it is true AP image. So after we are having the true AP image, next step is to make the end plate parallel. Here you see what is the difference between this end plate 
And this end plate, you can see in this end plate has a two, two line. This end plate is having the one line. This end plate also have a two line, but it is again overlapped so much that you cannot understand anything. So can we appreciate this? That this level is having two one line. This level has a two line. Why? Because here at this level, CM beam is falling perpendicular to the end plate. So that anterior border and the posterior border of the vertebral end plates are seen as a single line. Whereas here it is not falling perpendicular. That's why it is not looking as a single line. Here it is single line. Here it is a double line. Is it clear to everybody? So if we used to do the procedure is this level, I'm ready. I need not do change anything. But if I used to do the procedure at this level, I have to make a craniochordal change, craniochordal change, so that this comes in a single line. Now look at the CM, how we are changing it. You see, I'm making it cranial tilt. And now we see how it looks. Now it's becoming one line, not still completely one line. You see how the CM is beating, we are, we are making a cranial tilt. So that means what you have to understand that to have a, you know, the end plate making parallel for the lower lumbar, you can see now this is looking as a single line. So to have a procedure in the lower lumbar, you have to make it a cranial tilt. Cranial tilt means the CM is tilted towards cranial side. This is your cranial side, tilted towards the cranial side. Which part of the CM? II. II is tilted to the cranial side. If your IA is tilted to the cranial caudal side, this side is a caudal side, then you should call it as a caudal tilt. And this is known as the cranial tilt. So I made a cranial tilt to make the end plate parallel. So now I am ready to do the procedure at this level. So what was the first step? First step is to have a true AP image. How to make a true AP image? To bring the spinous process in between the two pedicles so that it is equidistant. This is the first step. Next step is to make the end plate parallel. This in a single line. This is also known as squaring. Why it is called squaring? Because this vertebral body is now looking like a square. If the CM beam is falling perpendicularly, then it is called the squaring. And the next step is your ipsilateral oblique. If you if are doing the procedure on this side, I'm making oblique, look at the CM, I'm making it oblique on that side. And now see this, how the picture is changing. Correct oblique. Hmm. Okay. So now, thing is, how much degree of the oblique to be done? So again, I'm making it first straight. Look at first. Then you look at, so now this was AP. I'll be just doing a little, little oblique. So now a little bit of oblique. So now this was your spinous process and this was your inferior to process. They are coming closer and this distance is increasing. So now I am making it more oblique and now we look what is happening. So now what is happening? The spinous process and the inferior to process are almost merging together. Are it together? Now it is completely merged. So this is your completely merged. So this much oblique you should do. Or somebody says that you see the facet joint is opened up very nicely. This is facet joint. So that is one, some end point. Somebody says that when this superior process comes in six o'clock position of the above pedicle, then that is the end point. Or somebody says, when well, you can imagine a very nice potty dog. That is Please remain muted, please, please. Please remain muted. I will talk with you after 45 minutes. Okay. So these are the endpoints. But the best endpoint is merge the inferior ductal process and the spinous process together. Then that is the best endpoint because other endpoints are really vague. And here at this point, you can imagine a Scottish dog. So this is the ear of the Scottish dog. This is the nose of the Scottish dog. 
This is the face of the Scottish dog. Here is the eye of the Scottish dog. This is the neck of the Scottish dog. This is the front leg. This is the body. Again, Sunita Jadab, you are repeatedly talking. Please. Yes. yes, sir. We can't see. You can't see means? X-ray is not visible, sir. It's visible to us. Is it visible? It is very well visible. Okay, then it might very be well. an internet problem. Well, the... Sunita Jadab, very well. check your internet problem, internet connectivity. Okay, sir. And uh, if you cannot see internet connection is not that good, you can see the recorded lectures later on as well. Okay, so what I was trying to tell that the Scottish dog. So this is the body of the Scottish dog. This is the hind leg of the Scottish dog and this is the tail of the Scottish dog. So this is a nice Scottish dog. So when you can imagine the Scottish dog, now you have to understand what part is this, which one. So again, let me clear the Scottish dog first. So ear of the Scottish dog is found by uh, Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Suddenly, suddenly there is power cut. You know, I'm just checking it. Uh, if it is not coming, so what we can do is uh, I basically connected with my mobile hotspot. If the power is not coming, I'll be continuing it to the next class. Next class will be having the demonstrations of the other part. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to explain what I was going to see it here, and then let me try. So my screen is visible, no? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. Sir. Let me explain the different parts of the Scottish dog here, and then I'll be checking. I'll be trying to tell uh, uh, how to manipulate the needle. If it is not, then next day I'll be doing it. So what I was trying to tell that this is your superior articular process. Okay. Let me start the annotation. Uh, can you see the? Is my screen is shared or not? No, screen no, is not shared. No, Sorry, I'm sharing the screen. Sir. Okay, can you, uh, my screen is shared now? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. okay, okay. So what I was trying to tell that this was your superior articular process. Uh, uh, sorry, again, annotation. So this was your superior articular process. Uh -huh. This was your transverse process. So this was one pedicle. This was another pedicle. So if you few procedures can be done by this Scottish dog view, and you know, World Institute of Pain have very important good tie or, or scarf, or the the tie or the scarf has the Scottish dog image printed there. Because the Scottish dog image is so important. With this Scottish dog image, you can do the several procedures together. If you wish to do the transforminal epidural, your needle should be coming here. Transforminal epidural in your subpedicular approach. Because nerve root comes like this. And nerve root, again, let me draw the nerve root very nicely. Nerve root comes like this. And this nerve root makes, there is two triangle. One triangle is draw a line below the pedicle till the lateral border. And along with the lateral border, you come another line. So this triangle is known as the safe triangle. Safe triangle. 
And this triangle, which is bounded above and obliquely by the nerve root, below by the a line drawn over the pedicle, that means inferior uh, upper part of the pedicle, which is the inferior, inferior border of the foramen, and medially by the inferior reticular process and the superior reticular process. So this triangle is known as the Cambine's triangle. So this triangle is classically known as safe triangle, but actually it is unsafe triangle. Why? Because the nerve root is there, the accompanying blood vessels are there. If you're doing a procedures under the CM, you cannot see the nerve, you cannot see the blood vessel. So you might be thinking it is a safe, but actually it is unsafe. Whereas in the Cambine strangle, the lower part of the nerve, this is also called the infraneural approach to do the transformational epidural. So here, there are some tiny blood vessels are there, some ligaments are there, and mostly it is the loose areolar tissues, so that you know you can do a procedure there in that Cambine strangle, and where we will not be having any major complications if we are introducing your needle in the inferior part of your the triangle, which is known as the Cambine strangle. So to enter into the foramen, transforaminal epidural injection, you are having the two approach. One approach is also known as supraneural approach. It'll be coming here in this part. And another approach is known as your Cambine strangle approach, where you are going to enter into the inferior part of the foramen. And this is known as the infraneural approach. Is it clear to everybody? So transforaminal epidural are having the two options to go into the foramen. The above the, above the nerve root or below the nerve root. Above the nerve root is known as your supraneural approach or the safe triangle approach, or also these are the two other names. One is your subparticular approach or also known as the nerve root sleeve injection or also known as the selective nerve root injection or also known as the, uh, the dorsal root ganglion because this exit, this exiting nerve root, here the dorsal root ganglion is situated here. So if you wish to go to inject around the dorsal nerve root, particularly if you wish to do the radio frequency of the dorsal nerve root, dorsal root ganglion. So the dorsal root ganglion injection is, so this injection, if you're coming here, what are the different names? A lot of names are there. One is safe triangle approach of transformational epidural. Number two is selective nerve root injection because selectively you are injecting around this nerve root. Third is, your nerve root sleeve injection, dorsal root ganglion injection, subparticular approach of the transformational epidural or supraneural approach of the uh, transformational epidural. So these are the, all the different names. And you remember this triangle, you know, one line draw below the pedicle, inferior border of the pedicle, another line drawn around this. This is yours, your safe triangle. So now this is your exiting nerve root. Exiting nerve root concept is very important. I'll be Many times when I'll be talking about the MRI class, when I'll be talking about the other classes, I'll be talking about the exiting nerve root and the traversing nerve root. So this is your exiting nerve root. And here is another exiting nerve root. This is another exiting nerve root. So this was your L4 exiting nerve root, L4, and this is your L3 exiting nerve root. So now L3 exiting nerve root is traversing at this level. L4 exiting nerve root is traversing at this level. So now, if you are doing a Cambine strangle approach, that means your needle is coming here. So which nerve root is closer to you? It is the traversing nerve root. Traversing nerve root basically traverses close to the foramen. Just proximal part of the foramen, we also call this as a lateral recess. So to do a traversing nerve root injection, you have to go into the Cambine strangle approach, and that is also known as the lateral recess injection. So there are few names for the, if you are approaching the inferior part of the foramen, one is known as your, the, uh, the infraneural approach. Another name is your Cambine strangle approach. Another name is your, the lateral recess injection. So, but here, remember again, that when you are injecting at this place, just lateral to the, you know, the, uh, the superarticular process. This is superarticular process. Just lateral to your superarticular process. Then your, it is not selective. The drug will be going both here as well as here. So to do a selectively blocking one nerve, 
you have to go to the supraneural approach or the septangle approach. And when you are going into the lateral lysis approach or the Cambin triangle approach, then your selectivity will not be there. So basically, you are going to inject both exiting as well as traversing nerve root at that foramen. So in a particular foramen, we are having the two nerve roots. Like here, this is L3-4 foramens, L3, L4. L3-4 foramen, one nerve root is exiting. This is L3 exiting nerve root. One nerve root is traversing. This is known as the traversing nerve root. So these are for the L3-4 level. So now another thing to remember that suppose this is your L4 nerve root. So this L4 nerve root can be blocked at two levels. One is at here and another it at here. So either by the subparticular approach at L4-5 or the Cambin triangle approach of L3-4. So this is way a nerve root can be targeted, a nerve root can be reached at the two different levels, either where it is traversing, like here, where it is traversing, or where it is exiting. Either you come here in the safe triangle approach or you come as a Cambin triangle approach. Okay, is this part is very clear to everybody. This is a very important concept. Everybody should understand it very nicely. I can repeat any number of times till you all of you are understanding this. Any Sir, questions? I have regarding... a question. Yes, yes. Sir, uh, like you said, the uh, every nerve can be approached with two, one from the uh, sub uh, pedicular and the other one is near the cambium so, uh, triangle. So why do we go for the safe triangle approach when it is uh, when there are vessels and everything over there? Why can't we go for cambium yeah. triangle approach in, for every nerve? That is true, but uh, or you can ask the question in a different way. You could have asked me, sir, what are the indications of a, doing a transformational approach in a safe triangle approach? Isn't it? Ah, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you what are the indications to do a transformational epidural by a safe triangle approach. Okay, so the most important indication for a transformational epidural by safe triangle approach is you know what? If you are selectively doing a diagnostic block, you know, many times what happens that you are not sure that which nerve root is basically involved from where, which is the pain generator. So what do you have to do? You give a very small amount of the local anesthetic and you just see whether the pain is relieved or not. If your pain is nicely relieved, so then you understand that this is the, this is the, you know, culprit. So one of, one indication is your, what? a diagnostic selective nerve root injection. So there you have to go in the safe triangle approach. And second, very important again, is suppose somebody is having a chronic long-standing radicular pain. You have done everything. Even you have done surgery, even then the patient is having the pain. So one of the options to treat this pain is dorsal root ganglion radiofrequency. And if you wish to do the dorsal root ganglion radiofrequency, then you have to come close to your dorsal root ganglion. And where is your dorsal root ganglion? So as I, again drawing, this is the nerve root and the dorsal root ganglion is here. So you have to go close to the dorsal root ganglion. You cannot do it by the Cambin triangle approach. You have to go into the sep triangle approach close to the dorsal root ganglion and then only you have to do it. Understood what are the indications? Still uh, why yes, you sir. do it? Yes, okay. sir, understood. Sir, uh, one more question. So the yes, triangles, yes. what we are seeing on the X-ray, they are two-dimensional, but uh, in reality, it is a three-dimensional structure. So should we go into the uh, middle of the triangle and give the drug, or should we be going to the... Uh, I'm showing you. I'm showing you in the 3D, but as I told you, when you're doing the procedure in the in the CM, means you are basically drawing a 3D imaginary in your head. And by looking at the different angle, you have to understand that you are above the nerve root or below the nerve root. Right? I'll be showing you right now. The power is here. I'm ready to do the procedure. Any other questions are there? Before I'm going into the procedure, I told you this is very, very important part. Sir, uh, sir, is ko ek bar fir se samjha dijiye na. Wo kindly repeat this one. The sub, uh, matlab ki Cambian approach and sub triangle approach, exiting nerve root and transversing aach, aach, approach. Take it, take it. Don't worry, don't worry. That's what they that. So, uh, just you know, explore the product. Okay, so now this 
level is your L3. L3. This is your L4. This is your L5. Okay. So this foramen is your L3 for foramen. L3 for foramen. Right? This foramen is from one pedicle to another pedicle. Lower border of the above pedicle and the upper border of the below pedicle. This foramen is your L4-5 foramen. From L4 pedicle till the L5 pedicle. Up to this is clear? This is clear. All sir, these steps can are you important. show the 3D image, sir? Please let me complete this question. Then I'll be going to that. I'm just trying to clear you. What is the yeah. traversing and exiting now? Right? So this was your L34. So now, what is this now, root? L, L, L. L3 exiting now, root. L3 exiting now, root. And because this is exiting at this L34 level, this is L3 exiting now, root. Right? So now, what is this now, root? L4, 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 L4 exiting now root at this L4-5 level. But the same now root is traversing at the level of the L3-4. L3, so this now root, L4 now root, L4 now root is called exiting at L4-5 level. And same L4 now root is called traversing now root at L3-4. Level. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, okay sir. Got it. It is the same knob root. At some level, it is called exiting. At some level, it is called traversing. And now, if your needle is here at the Cambian triangle approach, you are non-selectively blocking both these. But when you are, this is your Cambian triangle approach. But when you are giving it here, you are selectively blocking either dorsal root ganglion or this knob root selective. Clear to everybody? <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Thank Any you, other sir. questions before I'm going to the, do the procedure? No. Any other questions? Okay. So, few other procedures are done in this view. I was telling you. One procedure is the median nerve. You know, median nerve is coming like this. I shown you that nerve root is divided into ventral rami, dorsal rami. Dorsal rami has three branch. One is medial branch, media, the intermediate and the lateral. So, medial branch again has the Two articular branch, one goes above to supply this one, another goes supply to this one, and another is supplying the multifidus muscle, and some fibers goes into interspinous ligaments as well. So this is your medial branch. So one facet joint is supplied by one medial branch coming from above and one coming from same level. So this facet joint, this is another nerve root. So one medial branch is going to supply this one. So this facet joint, if you wish to block, your needle one should be coming here, another needle should be coming here. So two medial branch to be done for one facet joint injection. And if you wish to go for the intraarticular injection, then your needle should be coming here. This is the facet joint. Bounded one side by the superior articular process laterally and medially by the inferior articular process. So I'll be showing these four procedures today. One is your the supraneural approach or shape triangle approach of the transformational epidural. One is Cambin's triangle approach. One is your facet joint intraarticular. Another is your medial branch block. So before going for the procedures, if you are having any question, you can ask me. Sir, ye sir kind of repeat this one, na, jo abhi aapne samjhaya, sir. Ye kafi <laughs> complicated lag raha hai, sir. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Which one? Tell, 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 tell. Part, I can repeat any part. number of times, no issues. Tell me again. Which one? Ye last part, sir. Jo they have the multiple connections and you have told about the... I will uh, give Passage injection at this point, okay. at this point. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Explain I'm, the branches and everything. I'm, I'm showing you, I'm showing you. So this, is, this was your nerve root. I have just shown you, this is the exiting nerve root. And this gets divided, I have shown you the, only the ventral rami, but there is nerve roots after coming onto the foramen, this is divided into ventral rami and dorsal rami. Okay, so now this dorsal rami has three branch. One is medial branch, one is intermediate, another is lateral branch. Medial branch, again, have two articular branch. One is going to supply the above, the same level facet joint. One is going to above the inferior level facet joint. Another is muscular branch to go supply the multipedus muscle is running here. 
and again it is going into the interspinous ligament. So just consider the medial branch only. Con don't consider the anything else. Okay. So knob root, ventral rami, dorsal rami. Dorsal rami has medial branch, intermediate branch, lateral branch. Medial branch has one articular branch going to supply the same level and another going to supply the below level facet joint. These are articular branch, superior articular branch and inferior articular branch of the medial branch of the dorsal rami of the exiting nerve root. And same medial branch also goes to supply the muscular branch, which is going to supply the multifidus muscle. You remember, no? the erector spiny, there are three muscles. Most medial is multifidus, then is your longissimus, then is your iliocostalis. These are the three important muscles. Remember, in the ultrasound, I'll be able to show you all the individual three individual muscles. I'll be showing you on the third module of the back pain. So multifidus muscle is the most medial muscles. In the CRM, you cannot see the multifidus muscles, but in the USD, you can see the multifidus muscle. So those are supplied by the medial branch. And interspinous ligament is there in the two spinous process. That is also supplied by the interspinous and the supraspinous. That is also supplied by the medial branch. So if we are going to block this medial, this passage joint, this passage joint is supplied one by the same level and another medial branch will be coming to supply this one. So your one needle should be coming here to block this medial branch. Another needle should be coming here to block the above level. That means if you are doing the L3-4 level, then one needle should be on the L3 that is blocking L2 medial branch. Another level should be at the level of the L3, which is uh, L4, which is, sorry, uh, let me just try it again so that you can understand it basically best, better. So this is one uh, exiting nerve root. This is one medial branch from the exiting nerve root. And this is having the supply like this. So this is was your four. This was your three. So this facet joint is was your L3-4 facet joint. L3-4. So this L3-4 facet joint, what is this nerve root medial branch of what? L3 or L4 or L5? L3, exactly. L3. L3. So, so this facet joint, one supply is coming from the L3 medial branch. And what is this knob root? L2. L2. So another medial branch is coming from the L2. So if I'm asking this question, that how the L3-4 facet joint is innervated? Answer is, one is coming from the same level at the L3, another is coming from L2. L4. Is it clear? Clear to everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tell loudly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then I'll be yes, sir. That <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So, can I go with the procedure now? Please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, let me start from the beginning. So, can you remember what are the steps? First was true FAP. Then was end plate parallel. So here we are already having the end plate parallel and then oblique. How much oblique? When this transverse process and the inferior articular process come in the same line or when this is superior articular process coming in the six o'clock position or when you can imagine the Scottish dog very nicely. So now I am ready to do these procedures. So for doing the, you know, the sub particular approach, my needle should be here in Tunnel vision. Okay, let me talk about the tunnel vision first. So this is again very, very important for doing a, you know, for the interventional pain physician. Tunnel vision is very important concept to understand. So what is a tunnel vision? Why it is called tunnel vision? Suppose there is a tunnel. You are standing at the one end of the tunnel. How you will be looking about the other end of the tunnel? Is it like a circular structure? But if somebody is seeing from the lateral side or the side, they will be seeing as a long tunnel. So same way, say for example, this is a needle. And your CR beam is coming like that. How will see? You will see this as a line. But if the CR is coming in this way, you will see as a dot, as a circular dot. So when your CR will be in line with the needle, then that is called tunnel vision. And you will be seeing your needle, whole needle, as a small dot. That is your tunnel vision. Clear? So now I will be placing this needle one for the subparticular approach tunnel vision here. For the Cambin triangle, my needle should be here. For the facet joint interarticular, my needle should be here. And for the 
uh, your the medial branch block my needle should be here okay internal vision then i'll be going for the lateral view to see each needle position because lateral view is important only ap oblique is not important so now let me place the needles that needle the chuck So normally again, another very important thing is your, which needle is recommended here? So my needle is your 22 gauge spinal needle for doing almost all the spinous process. So you need to have a 22 gauge spinal needle, 22 gauge spinal needle and black color. No? And length is normally we take 10 centimeter length, 22 gauge spinal needle. And again, if somebody is asking, what is your needle entry point? How much away from the midline? So there is nothing called how much away from the midline. Here is important is you have to place your radio opaque marker here. Picture. 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 Okay, that is my needle entry point. So I have not measured anything. How many centimeter from the iliac crest? How many centimeter from the midline? Nothing like that. So I am putting a radiological marker. Picture. Picture. Exactly below the six o'clock position of the pedicle. That is my needle entry point, and it should be in tunnel vision. Picture. Tunnel vision means it will be seen as a dot. So this is a dot tunnel vision and you have to advance the needle and checking by the lateral view. I'll be going with lateral view later on. I'll be just, I'm putting the all the needles together. Then I'll be showing the lateral view. Then for the cambium strangle approach, so this is the upper part of the foramen. For the, for the cambium strangle approach, I have to go into the lower part of the foramen. I'm doing at the procedure at level of the L45. L45 is one of the common area. So this is your superior articular process. So my needle should be there. Picture little more medial towards the midline picture. Again, in tunnel vision. Picture. 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 Okay. I have to check by the lateral who to understand how deep we are. Huh? So remember depth, direction, depth. So direction means in tunnel vision and again, depth I have to see by the lateral view. Okay, let me complete these two procedures. Then I'll be showing the other things. So at these positions, I am going in the lateral view. Look at the CM position. I'm changing the, rotating the CM. So the advancement of is done under the lateral view. So, are much superior and you have to maintain the lateral maintain the your tunnel vision you know picture where you should reach just the posterior part of the foramen posterior superior part so that is the end point there and for this below can be strangle approach picture Picture. 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 Okay, so that is that is the end point. And I have to check by the AP view also. So as I was telling earlier, so this was your upper boundary of the neural foramen. This is the lower boundary. Now root is occupied by here. So if you are advancing a little more, you are going to injure the nerve root. You are going to touch the knob root. Patient will be having lancinating pain if you're touching the knob root. So just your knob root needle should be just peeping the posterior margin of the your foramen and as much as posterior and as much as superior as possible. Here is the knob root. You know, here is the knob root. It should not be coming here. And blood vessels are also here. You should not be advancing it also. This part is comparatively free. You can advance it further. You can go inside the disc. If you're going the discography, you have to go like this. 
but here today we are not going to the discography here even if you are advancing the little little more coming up to here that means even if you are doing here picture then also it's fine and if you are advancing the little further basically now i am entering into the disc so if you are going to do a discography procedure we have to come like that that means cambin strangle approach and the discography is almost similar you just advance the needle a little more and you will be entering into the disc but for the upper the shape triangle you have to be very cautious you should not be going too much interior okay chalo ap ek bar chalo is it clear to everybody transforminal yes, approach one is the supraneural approach or the shape triangle approach another is your cambin triangle approach cambin triangle approach if you are advancing the needle further you are going inside the disc so to do a discography to do ozone nucleosis you have to go inside the disc like that and you have to put the dye you have to put the ozone or whatever you used to do even if you wish to do the endoscopic discectomy then also this is little bit of modification is needed but still basic thing is to understand the same below the nerve root and you have to enter into the foramen and through the foramen you will be entering into the disc picture so the ap view how will look let me clear the drawings so ap view your the nerve root was like this you know somebody was asking 3d how we are going so this is the your needle should be here it should not be going too deep little deep you can still go but not much and here by the cambin strangle approach i have entered into the disc and if i'm withdrawing it this little bit then it is the epidural injection cambin strangle approach epidural injection so these two procedures is clear to everybody yes so yes yes sir yes sir very yes, good, sir. Very good. Yes, sir. now let me go let me go to the next procedure that is your facet joint intraarticular and facet joint medial branch injection right so remember the first steps were same first step is first step is true ap right yes true ap so here is the true ap spinous process is equidistance next step is your end plane parallel wiring and next step is oblique okay so i have already uh, you know he has already done the oblique <laughs> so same procedure same steps to repeat he has already done it so now as i was telling for intraarticular facet joint injection your needle should be coming here and for the medial branch your needle should be coming here in the eye of the scotty stop okay so now let me put the needle there again what is our needle entry point needle entry point depends mm -hmm. on your radiology not depending on your how much centimeter from the midline how much centimeter from the iliac crest never picture picture okay this is the eye of the scotty dot picture junction of the superior process and the again in the tunnel vision picture so this is a tunnel vision and i am going into the eye of the scotty stock and here you can go directly and hit the body bone there you have to go and hit the bone there i am hitting the bone then i'll be going to the lateral view and for the intraarticular again i can see the joint there so picture 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 okay so picture so here any part of the joint is okay some book says in the mid the lower part but that is not important anywhere you can go upper part only thing is that you can if you are going the upper part the nerve root is there you can go into the foramen lower part less chance of going into the foramen but otherwise any part of the facet joint is okay so now i am going in again tunnel vision my needle is on the joint line over the joint line sorry i am not touching the bone you have to touch the bone there now i am inside the joint though complete inside the joint is not possible here because it is a mannequin so i'll be just in the mouth of the joint so at this point i'll be going lateral so the lateral what will happen what will you see that my needle is for the medial branch over the transverse process as i show you 
the transverse process will be seen as a tunnel vision is a circular rounded. So your needle should be resting there, not entering into the foramen. And for the facet and interarticular, it will be over the superior or in the inferior articular process. Picture there. Okay, you can see this below needle is over the picture the half is over the your transverse process. You see, this is the transverse process of one side. This is transverse process. Another side transverse process is here, basically not marching together nicely. Because here you can see the two lateral border. Let me try to march it nicely. Okay. That is not a true lateral view. Now it is coming as a true lateral view. Right. Now it is true lateral view. You know? So let me clear the drawings. Why I was telling two lateral view? Earlier, this border was seen as a two lateral border. So now it is merged into one. So it is a two lateral view. So this is your transverse process. This is your superior trigger process. So your needle should be coming at this junction. And here, this is the facet joint. And it is coming here. This is interarticular. In real patients, your needle can be advanced a little bit up to here, but not much. Remember that the facet joint is a carved one. One is concave, another is convex. So you cannot get through and through the joint. You can see come only in the mouth of the joint, not completely inside. Okay. So facet joint intraarticular and facet joint medial branch. Is it clear to everybody? Is it clear to everybody? You yes. are blocking. So you are blocking the opposite side of the uh, of where you are standing, right? Opposite side means? Ma ma uh, I mean... Uh, oh, yeah. That is always. Procedure. That should be always. Suppose, if you wish, this is left side. I am doing the procedure on the right side. So, whether you are doing the procedure on the right side or left side, you should be always standing opposite to the CM. So, my CM is placed on this side, right side of the patient. And standing on the left side of, of the patient's body, you should do procedures both for the right, left as well as for the right. Okay? But suppose yeah. if uh, there is uh, only one exception is when you are doing the endoscopic discectomy, though it is in the advanced class, then you turn the patient, suppose the patient is on the right side, then you turn the patient right side towards you. CRM, you need not change it. CRM will be opposite to the table, but you just change your patient head side so that the right side of the patient comes towards you. But for all other procedure, interventional procedures, your CRM should be opposite to you across the table, other side of the table, and you should do both right-sided or left-sided procedures standing opposite side of the CM. You should never stand on the same side of the CM. Is it clear to everybody? Sir, lateral view, can you explain once again? <clears throat> you know, this is your superarticular super process. You know, many may the confusion that up to this is superarticular process, but whole is superarticular process. Inferarticular process is whole is inferarticular process because they are joint overlapping with one another. This is your transverse process in the lateral view. So now your needle should be coming lateral view just over the transverse process, not going, you know, this is the dangerous area. Your needle should not be coming here. And uh, this is for the medial branch. And for the intraarticular, this is the joint margin. This, try to understand this. I'm clearing it again. You just check it. So this is your joint margin. This faint line is a joint margin. Your needle should be coming here. In real patient, you can enter a little bit more up to here, but not much. And for the medial branch, your needle should be resting over the transverse process here. It is the junction of the transverse process and the superior tubular process. That means upper part of this junction. Why? Because the nerve root comes, the medial branch comes like that. So your needle should be coming here, upper part. Is it clear? Yes, sir. And try to understand each and every structures, vertebral body, pedicle, the transverse process here, spinous process here, superior interarticular process is here, superior articular process is here. So the other structures. So nerve root occupies here, accompanied by two blood vessels here. And okay. these are the different needle placement there. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, can you explain the parts of Scottish dog once again, please? <laughs> okay, okay. 
Any other question by anybody? Shall we okay, I'm showing you again. So this is a spinal needle or epidural needle which you are using and what gauge? I've already shown you. Have you not seen? 22 gauge. 22 gauge. 22 gauge. 22 gauge spinal needle. Can you see this? 22 gauge spinal needle. Ordinary spinal needle. That's all. Okay, For sir. when you're doing radio frequency, that time you have to take the RF needle. But when you're doing the local anesthetic steroid and all those things, so then you have to use the 22 gauge spinal needle or 22 gauge spinal needle here in front of you. Okay, so somebody was asking to explain the Scottish dog different parts again. So again, this is your tail. Pedicle. Yes, this is your superior articular process. Superior articular process. This should be in your, you know, when you are dreaming also, you should be remembering all these different parts. <laughs> Another very important exercise I always tell to everybody that many of you are anesthesiologists or whenever you are getting in a scope to have a CM and a patient, just one or two sort, try to give the angle and see which part, how it looks. Or you can also have an exercise, search in the net and the Google, oblique view of the spine, lumbar spine. And you try to identify each and every structure because, you know, person to person variation might be there. Try to identify each and every structure there. Okay, so this was your neck. This was your neck. What happened? Okay, this is your neck. Neck is your. Oh, maybe my power is not there in the pain. Anyway. Uh, I'm showing you the, this is this is known as your pars interarticularis. This is your ear. That is your superior articular process. If you wish to do the medial branch block, your needle should be coming here at the junction of the superior articular process and transverse process. So this is your front leg, which is formed by the inferior articular process. This is the body formed by the lamina. This is the hind leg formed by the other side superior articular inferior articular process and the spinous process together. And the tail is by the opposite side spinal uh, transverse process. One thing you remember that to make the spinous process, uh, transverse process shorter, you have to make an ipsilateral oblique. Like you see that this side transverse process is shorter and the other side transverse process become larger if you are making the contralateral oblique. That means you have made oblique on the right side. So the left side transverse process is very big, tail of the Scottish dog. And this ipsilateral, that means in the right side transverse process are becoming very small. I hope... Everything is clear to everybody. No more questions. Yes, so the recording will be there and you just need to go through the recordings again and again. And you try to familiarize. So this is very, very important. What? Sir, after Somebody giving injection. Did? Yes, sir. Sir, after giving injection, patient, how many days will you remain pain free? If you are giving steroid, the steroid action remains there for few weeks to two months. If by that time, your patient is having the spontaneous recovery of the uh, disc prolapse, disc prolapse can be spontaneously recovered. Then you need not do anything more. So one injection might be enough. And if the patient is not having the spontaneous recovery, then you have to repeat it. But again, very repeated, very often, too much, too much number of steroid injection is not recommended. For the facet joint, medial branch block, radio frequency gives long-term relief. Steroid injection inside the joint gives again few months pain relief. But if there is a spontaneous recovery, that chance is always there. In that situation, patient might be having a long-term relief. Otherwise, only steroid injection, duration of pain relief is something between the two, three months. Okay? Thank you, sir. So how many times they can give this? Uh... Total dose of the steroid is, is limited. That means it is yeah. recommended that the total dose of the steroid, particular steroid, particular steroid means steroid are two types. One is your the non-particular steroid like dexamethasone, betamethasone. These are non-particular steroid, and some steroid as particulate like dipometrol, like trimethylone. These are particular steroid. Particular steroid remains in the body for the long time. 
for three weeks to three months is the duration of action. So particular steroid, if you are repeating too often, what will happen? There'll be cumulative effect of the steroid injection. The most dangerous steroid injection is your adrenocortical suppression. There are many other complications, you know the steroid. That is the reason why particular steroid cannot be repeated too often. Soluble steroid don't have any dose restriction. You can give any, any amount of the dose. But particular steroid, the dose restriction is there. What is the ceiling? You should not be crossing the ceiling. That is your three milligram per kg body weight. That means if somebody is weighing about 70 kg, so three into 70 means 210 milligram is a yearly dose. You cannot, should not, must not exceed that. And lifetime dose is your six milligram per kg. That means 420 milligram of steroid dose. Normally one vial contains how much? 40, 40 milligram. 40. Some vial contains 10 milligram also, but mostly it is 40 milligram. So lifetime dose of the steroid is six milligram per kg body weight. Normally many people, you know, not do not mention it how much injected, but that should be mandatory how much you are injecting. Even if you are not seeing subsequently the same patients, he might be going to another doctor. Even then, you should do justice to your patient. You should be mentioning how much milligram of steroid you have injected. Because finally, you should not be exceeding that level so that the side effects complications might be starts appearing. Okay. So the lifetime dose is your six milligram per kg body weight. And yearly dose is three milligram per kg body weight. You should not exceed that dose. Normally, per session, per sitting, we try to restrict ourselves with that 40 to 80 milligram. Don't go beyond for 80 milligram and try to restrict yourself in 40 milligram. Clear? 40 or 80 milligram is for yes. triamcinolone. The same for dipamidol and triamcinolone, same. It is equi equivalent dose. In 40 milligram triamcinolone is equivalent to the 40 milligram of dipomethyl. Dipomethyl means dipomethyl prednisolone. Same. Sir, for transferminal uh, blocks, uh, we prefer these uh, non particulates particularly, right? Pardon? Can you repeat the question again? For the transferminal blockade, we prefer uh, non particulate. We pr prefer non particulate as compared to the particulate. Normally, in the lumbar area, right. below the L2, non particular steroids, particular steroid is given below the L2. Above the L2, there is a blood vessels, artery, abdomen, quiz, cervical level, transferminal is not at all recommended. So, the, just remember, particular steroid can be given in the caudal epidural and transferminal epidural and interlaminal epidural below the level of the L2. Okay? Sir, sir one query, sir. With the steroid, we inject xylocaine or bupivacaine also? Or? Uh, both can be injected, but uh, xylocaine is preferable. The reason is, okay. suppose you are trying to do the epidural and accidentally you have reached the interthecal space and there is a total spinal. So what will happen? You have to ventilate the patient and yes. you have to manage this patient, ventilate this patient for the long time if you are using the sensor can in bupivacaine. If you are injecting the uh, xylocaine, then you are resuscitation process is shorter. So you are managing chronic pain. You are not managing the acute pain. Chronic pain means somebody who is suffering for the long time and you are trying to give pain relief for the long time. So there, few hours of additional pain relief because of the local anesthetic effect doesn't make the scenario anything. But complication-wise, if you're landing up with the complication of the local anesthetic, then you have to manage that complication much longer time. That is why many people like me prefer the lignocaine rather than sensor cane or bibliocaine. But both are can be given. How much should be the volume to be injected uh, if we use a low, lignocaine or xylocaine? Volume depends on where you are injecting. If you are injecting in the facet joint intraarticular, then you cannot inject more than 0.5 cc. If you are giving the transforaminal, if you are doing a selective nerve root diagnostic block, the doses should be 1 to 2 ml. But if you are doing a therapeutic, then you can go ahead with that. Let me remove the lead jacket. This is quite heavy. <laughs> so if you can, if you are going for the, you know, the transforaminal therapeutically, you can go something around four to six ml. But if you are giving for the diagnostic purpose, selective nerve root block, then your volume should not be much, it should be less. Okay, thank you, sir. Anything else? Some question was there in the chat box. I cannot read the chat box. Sir, if you can read sir, the chat sir, box. Sir, so sir, what are, whatever sir. the concentration of local anesthesia, sir, uh, whether it is uh, given for anesthesia or... Anesthetic to be 0.5 to 1%. Okay. 
not more than 1% because the motor blockage will be more. So the patient has to be resuscitated for the longer time if there is a profound motor block. So to minimize the motor block, your concentration of the lignocaine should be less than 1%, 1% or less. Uh, sir, uh, I want to ask that, uh, kindly repeat, below L2, I can give him the particulate steroid, but above right. the L2, I have to give him the non-particulate. Yes, sir. Is it, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Why? Uh, sir, uh, non-particulate. Why, 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 why? Why? Why above the L2, L2 or above? Artery of Adam is there. Artery of Adam Artery is basically they are reinforcing supplying the anterior spinal artery. So they are at the level of the L2 and above. That is the reason if we are going to inject anything particular steroid in the artery of Adam quiz, we are going to do land up with a infarction of the cord. And we have seen that kind of patients also. So please be sure that you are not giving particular steroid at the level of the L2 and above. Okay. Sir, any yeah, other question? Non, non particulate steroid ka sir duration of action kya hota hai, sir? How long you does tell, it work? You tell <laughs> if it is in the dexamethasone, how long should it work? Should six hours, four, six, eight point, hours. six but hours. Again, yes, but again, the thing is when you are giving you know, the steroid or other things, very recent theory is it is not the anti inflammatory action that is important. Another very important mechanism of action is washing out of the inflammatory debris. That is the reason why earlier small volume of the transformer epidural is recommended, but nowadays large volume is recommended. If you're giving a little bit larger volume, then you are washing out the inflammatory debris. And uh, as I told you, you know, the nucleus pulposus is, is very inflammatory and it causes the, there is uh, inflammatory mediators which is causing the pain. So if you're washing out, then you might be having the longer duration of pain relief, not exactly that of the duration of your, the non-particular steroid. And even some studies are there where there is no steroids are given, only local anesthetic. And they are also telling the results are encouraging because you are washing out your inflammatory debris there. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir, Somebody else, question. some ch any, chat box uh, question has... Time limit between two transfer amount blocks, like if we give one transfer amount to a person and he's not improving. So how frequently, uh, what should be the minimum... Uh, gap between uh, two transfer amana if we want to repeat it. Any trans any uh, depot steroid should not be repeated within three weeks because till three weeks it is having the very strong adenocortical suppression action. No steroid should be repeated within three weeks. If you are at all wish to repeat it, it should be mm -hmm. non-particulate. Particular steroid must not be repeated again. But again, if your diagnosis is correct, if your diagnosis is perfect, normally you are going to get a good result. But even then, if you are not getting the good result, this is in question which somebody is asking when to go for the endoscopic discectomy or surgical decompression. So the most important recommendation or what is the indication for the surgical recommendation is if there is a major motor deficit or if there is a autonomic deficits, that situation straight away to go for the surgical decompression. Surgical decompression can be your micro discectomy, laminectomy, or even endoscopic discectomy or our surgical decompression. If no such red flags or neurodeficits are there, then you can think for the transforaminal epidural. But again, if the pain relief is inadequate or if the pain relief is of short duration, then also you should be straight away going for the surgical decompression, not to repeat again the transforaminal epidural. Suppose somebody is having the less than one month pain relief, don't repeat it. You straight away refer to your surgery, surgery surgeon friend to do the surgical decompression. Or if you yourself are skilled to do the endoscopic discectomy, later on you can think for the endoscopic discectomy as well. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, Siris, no more questions there in the chat box? But I'm replying the chat box uh, as you have just said, red flags and- uh, Okay, okay, I'm... very good, very good. Very good, so no more questions, yeah. Sir, should be observed. How it can cause uh, uh, damage to the patient, or you said the resuscitation will be difficult. So, not difficult. I told if you are injecting interthecal, suppose you have injected bupivacan interthecal, and the patient is landing up with the uh, your the total spinal or paralysis. So that paralysis will be lasting for the long time, and you have to resuscitate the patient for the long time. This is what I tried to do. 
I got, 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 sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir, how many hours should we observe patient after giving steroid? If the complications are there, it will be there immediate. Intravascular, what are the complications of the local anesthetic and steroids? Local anesthetic complications are immediate if it is going into the intravascular space. There might be your, you know, perioral, you know, the um, symptoms, then your the convulsions. Convulsion is not because of the lignocaine itself, it is because of the preservative. There might be drowsiness, there might be coma, cardiovascular side effects are. There might be bradycardia, there might be cardiac arrest, there might be heart block. You have to immediately give atropine in those situations. So these are the immediate, most commonly observed immediate complication. And uh, the long-term complications are not because of the local anesthetic. Long-term complications can be because of the steroid itself. So steroid might be going into the vessel and it can cause the immediate, you know, in, I told you here in Calcutta also, not in my hand, but one complication reported here in Calcutta after the epidural patient landed up with the quadriplegia because there is a vessels can go up to the, you know, the cervical area and the cervical cord was basically the anterior spinal artery and uh, it causes, cause the quadriplegia. So epidural is one of the procedure, whether you are going for the caudal or transforaminal or interlaminal, epidural is the most dangerous procedure, particularly if you are giving the particular steroid. It's not that dangerous if you are giving the non-particular steroid. So I always tell the beginners to be always trying to practice it with the non-particular steroid. And then gradually you can go for the particular steroid. So always remember this is dangerous. So while taking the consent, joint is not that dangerous. Sir, I, yes. I have any question. Okay, I have not completed the answer. Let me complete this answer. So Sir, I have a question. how long the patient should be observed? So normally, all these all these side effects, if it is there, immediate. So you should be observing for half an hour to one hour. If the complication is there, then you have to manage the complication until the patient has completely recovered. Otherwise, half an hour to one hour observation should be there. If the patient is having the profound motor loss, don't discharge the patient till the motor loss is recovered. It might be taking two hours also. Okay, now other questions. Sir, I have a question. Sir, mm -hmm. when I used uh, quadral uh, steroid, uh, non-particular, but uh, specifically, uh, it mixed with lidocaine, is it any dangerous? For patient? No, you can make, very commonly we mix it with lignocaine. No, no problem. Been using 5% bupivacan. You can use the bupivacan also. I told you bupivacan I personally don't use because if you're landing up with any side effects like motor, motor block or other, uh, then you have to manage the patient for the longer time. You have to keep the observation for the longer time. That is the disadvantage of using the bupivacan. But otherwise, bupivacan or, or lignocaine, either of that can be used and mixed with the local anesthetic and the steroids. Sir, okay. I have one query. Sir, I have one query, sir. sir yes, tell in me. One of, in one of my patients, after the caudal block, the patient developed urinary incontinence for a short period of time, like uh, mm -hmm. 12 hours or for a one day. Sir, is mm -hmm. it a known common complication? Yes, I sometimes was, it can. I was quite Not afraid for the caudal that epidural. After not for the caudal epidural steroid, even after the caudal anesthesia or epidural anesthesia, lumbar epidural anesthesia, this can happen. And this can this is because of the your autonomic uh, blockage. So it can sometimes, normally it uh, recovers if it is giving lignocaine, normally recovers within an hour. But sometimes the local anesthetic action can be even much longer than what is expected, what is seen in the normal person. Yes, sir. Seen, it lasted you know, for around 12 hours. hours. I got, after I got afraid what happened. I didn't know the complications. So this is because of the local anesthetic complication. And in some patients, those who are, I, I don't know, are you an anesthesiologist? No, sir. I'm a practicing orthopedic. Okay. So anesthesiologists know this. Sometimes okay. after the epidural anesthesia, the patient is having the profound motor block or urinary incontinence that lasts for you know, 12 hours or one day also. Because this local anesthetic action, normally one hour, lignocaine, but yes. it can be prolonged in some patients. Okay? So in okay. this situation, many times I got many calls from my fellows. Sir, no patient is unable to move the leg or in the incontinence, what shall I do? I, I always assure them, I tell them, they assure your patient, keep the patient admitted in the hospital, don't discharge it. 
and observe it, it will be surely going. You cannot land up with a match, you know, major complications uh, with ma majority of the procedures, except for I told you, particular steroid, if it is injected in the blood vessel, it can be dangerous. That is the reason why you always give dye, see that the dye is not vanishing, dye is having the normal flow and it is there along the nerve root. Then only you inject. If the dye is partially or completely vanishing, that means your needle is inside partially or completely in the vessel. Sometimes aspiration may be negative because when you're aspirating, no, there might be valve-like things, part of the valve vessel, valve-like things will be closing as you are aspirating it. So aspiration negative means nothing. You have to confirm it by dye injection. Dye must not be vanishing. Dye must be there. Then only you can inject the particular steroid. Otherwise, never, ever. Okay. Sir, uh, you, you told we have to inject for diagnostic block uh, less volume for local anesthesia. Yes. If you are giving for, la larger volume, what will happen? You tell. And for th more uh, large volume, like, like uh, less volume means like 0.5 ml is enough for diagnostic block. No, no, no. no. For the diagnostic root block, 1 to 2 ml. 1 to 2 ml. If you are giving and larger volume, what will happen? It will go to the adjacent above and the below level, even to the opposite side, and your diagnostic validity will be lost. So you must be giving very small amount to just block the exiting nerve root. That's all. And for that, and for one to two is recommended. For the facet joint, medial branch and the facet joint interarticular, it is only 0.5 cc. For the nerve root, one ml to two ml. Try to limit lesser volume for the diagnostic purpose. Uh, Hello. Yes, yes. Uh, so which one one, please. I'll be answering all the questions. I'll not be leaving till all the cancer questions are answered. So one by one, please. Which approach uh, is desirable to be done in uh, post laminectomy patients sir, who has those screws implanted, like subpedicular or the cambins? Because pedicle is not very well appreciated. It, 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 it is, I already mentioned it. Each nerve root can be targeted at two different approach. One is subpedicular where it is exiting. Another is your cambin strangle where it is traversing. So depending on your visibility of your procedures, you know, your target, you first identify which nerve root to be injected. That depends on the patient's symptoms, where the pain is going, whether it is in the towards the great toe, that means L5, whether towards the greater malleolus, the medial malleolus, then so in that way, you try to understand that which nerve root is your target. And then that nerve root, you can have the two approach, either by the safe triangle or by the cambin triangle approach. So now you decide where it is best visible, go there. No, no difference between these two. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, which dye is used by you? Dye should be always water-soluble, non-ionic dye. The most commonly used dye all over the world is your iohexol. There are few others water soluble dye which can be used, but still side effects, complications with the iohexol is very minimal. I am practicing pain for more than 25 years and maybe around 30 years. I have never came across any dye related complication, any allergic reaction with iohexol, but those things has been reported with the other dyes. So it should be always non-ionic water soluble. Why? Because if you are injecting accidentally into the intrathecal space, you can land up with arachnoditis. It's a very bad complication. So the dye which is used for the myelography, where intentionally you are injecting in the intrathecal space, is the same dye, that is iohexol. So the iohexol is an water-soluble non-ionic dye, and that is the recommendation. Don't think of any other dye. So what Are about blocking the S1 nerve root? S1 nerve root block I'll be covering next day. Not today. Sir, IOXL ka kaun sa strength lete hai, sir? Wo 30 to 70 karke ko aata hai na, sir. Okay, IOXL, you know, the side may, there will be written 300, 200, 250, yes, like sir. that. So what is the meaning of that? 300 means 300 milligram of iodine per ml of the dry. So how much concentrated iodine will be taking depends on the patient's obesity. If the patient is obese, then you need to have a more concentrated dye. Otherwise, you will not be because their exposure is more. So to see the obese patient structures, you have to give more exposure. And to give the more exposure, dye is better visible if the dye is concentrated. So that is the reason why that to have the 
you know, normally as a whole, the average build, suppose somebody is having approximately 70 kg weight, then your dye concentration can be something around 150 to 200 milligram of the uh, iodine. That means if you are taking 300 mg dye, then you make it two volume, two part of the dye or half part of the dye and half part of the distilled water to dilute and to give. If the patient is too much obese, 100 kg, more than 100 kg, then you should consider of more than 200 milligram, maybe 250 milligram. If the patient is very lean and thin, then you consider about the 150 milligram or 120 milligram. That means it dilute with the dye to make the concentrations depending on what is the you know, structure of the patient, whether the patient is too much obese or the patient is lean and thin, depending on that. Clear? Clear, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, for beginners, you said uh, non-particulate steroid should be used. And for how many weeks we can expect relief for the patient, sir? I already mentioned this, that theoretically it is six hours, but practically it is more than that. Practically it can be several months because you have washed out the inflammatory debris from the, around, from the foramen. Okay. So uh, normally we can expect one or two repeat doses. Also, we can uh, it can be required for patients. Yes, for the non-particular steroid, you can repeat it. There is no restriction of the doses. Also, sir. Restriction of the doses is for the particular steroid. Yes, sir. Okay. So thank you very much. It is almost eight thirty. Let us leave today. If you still have some question. You look at the videos and next day we can answer your question if you're having some questions. Back pain sir, is very important. Pain procedures are most commonly done procedures. You should be learning it very nicely. Sir, excuse me, sir. One, I have one question. Yes, yes, sir. sir tell, uh, tell. Actually, sir, I want to know the indication of that block. But uh, I mean, in what cases I have to give what type of uh, block? That is my question. You just give the, give the example. Transformina? Uh, yeah. Transforminal, the most common or most important indication is your radicular pain in prolapsed disc. Sometimes it is also given for the internal disc disruption, but for that you have to come bilateral for both the sides. So this is the most common indications. Right? For the facet joint, if it is a facet joint pain, then you have to go for the facet joint injection. So make a diagnosis first before running for the procedure. Sir, Sir, how do you decide that facet joint block is required or medial branch blo uh, block is required? Medial so branch is block is always better because you can do the radio frequency ablation, you can give the long term relief. If you don't have a radio frequency machine, then the, you know you can go for the interarticular steroid as well. But interarticular steroid is not the best treatment for the facet pain. Best treatment, long term treatment is radio frequency ablation of the medial branch. Uh, sir, okay, how, sir, how can we differentiate between the drug spread in an epidural space or and in the CSF? I mean, obviously, the there will be backflows of CSF from the needle. No, no, no. Back so the most important way to understand your whether it is an epidural space is the epidural spread. Just remember, note it down. Sometimes I give this question in the exam also. So what are the characteristics of the dye spread? How do you know that it is a very important, very good question? So Negative the, pressure. Number one is the nerve root will be visualized. If it is intrathecal space, the dye will not be coming along the nerve root outside the spine. It will be within the lateral border of the spine. But if it is in the epidural space, dye will be coming outside the spine. This is the most important. Then second important thing is the dye spread will be homogeneous if you are in the intrathecal space. Dry spread will be heterogeneous because the fat globules are there, blood vessels are there. It will be never hetero homogeneous if it is in the epidural space. Number three, if you are looking at the lateral view, some dye will be seen in the anteriorpidural space, some dye will be seen in the posteriorpidural space, so it will be like a railroad, two lines will be seen. If it is in the intrathecal space, it will be in the middle, not two border. In the epidural lateral view, there will be two distinct border. Dye will be accumulated in the posterior and the anteriorpidural space. And th fourth, again, that is important, how much volume you have given and how much spread it is there. If you are given a normal lumbar sacral radius, per segment you need a 1.5 to 2 ml per segment, you can calculate that dose. Another important spread of the dye is very important. That is not, cannot be done deliberately, but accidentally it can happen. That is your, the subdural injection. 
So can you tell me, Pratibha, you are asking this question, where is the subdural space located? Uh, just beneath the uh, dura, sir. Between the dura and? Arachnoid. Arachnoid. So above the dura is your epidural space. Between yes. the dura and the arachnoid is your subdural space. Between the arachnoid and the pyometer is your intrathecal space, subarachnoid space. So the subdural space, the space is very thin. In, no, whenever we are puncturing the dura, normally we puncture both dura as well as the arachnoid. Separately, just puncturing the dura intentionally is impossible. But accidentally, it can happen. So accidentally, you can go into the subdural space. So how to know? Because this space is very thin. So very small amount of the dye will be spreading very wider segment. That means if you, if you have given 0.5 ml, even then you'll be seeing that the four or five segment has been spread and it will be homogeneous and the linear spread. So that is another kind of spread that is important. So subdural injection, subarachnoid injection and epidural injection. So these are three kinds of dye you should be understanding and remembering this. Thank you, sir. Thank so what is homogeneous spread, sir? Huh? Homogeneous, homogeneous means... Spread? Homogeneous means uniform spread. Heterogeneous means dye is accumulating here and there, not uniform spread. Any pictures, okay. sir? Huh? Any pictures depicting that? Picture? Right now, I have a picture is not ready. I'll be showing you a picture next time. All other oh, you can search the... I'll be showing you the typical dye spread. And uh, you can go to our YouTube channel. I hope all of you are the YouTube subscriber of the Doradia Pain Clinic YouTube channel. You go there. There are lots of videos of there, epidural spray, cordial epidural, and dye spray is up there. Transpyramidal, cordial, how is the look, the dye spray? You look at that. And next day, oh. I'll be this. Sure. Sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir Dora, they have okay. Okay. If you when we do not have CM, then, then can we go for interlaminar epidural? Intervertebral. Interlaminar epidural is, you can go always, but that is an inferior choice. Because I that dye, I really have shown you that it will be, it has to go anteriorly, then only it will be effective. But still, if you cannot go transforminal, you can go interlaminar. But then what should be the volume? Uh, interlaminar right. volume depends on your per segment 1.5 to 2 ml. So suppose if your needle space is one segment above or one segment below, then it should be something around 4 ml. Because 2 ml will be going above, 2 ml will be going down. So depending on your distance between the your target area and your needle, you have to multiply by four. Why four? Because two ml will be going above, two ml will be going down. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Let us end here and go through the recording again and again. And I'll be posting the Kahoot also. I hope everybody is going to the Kahoot. And completing the Kahoot. No, what is that? Kahoot is you go to your website. You go to the website and there are multiple choice questions, not about the based on the discussions. So that try to answer those multiple choice. This is an exercise, basically. You will be able to oh. you know understand, test yourself how much you have read. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much and good night. Good night. Have your dinner. Good night. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.